with that. I'm going to introduce David to you. Now, David, both David and I were in New York about six weeks ago um, at a research event speaking, and they asked us to write our own introductions to our talks. Um, and I made some crack about, you know, be, you know, really appreciate me because I was missing a really important part of Thistle game that day. And, um, I had to explain to people afterwards that it was only a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to steal Dave's introduction there because if you've seen him before, he is very inspirational. But please, could you put your hands together for that old bastard? <laughs> I thought what we should do, I thought what we should do just straight away is, I thought we should all get together and shout something. And the thing I want you to shout, okay, it's very simple, very straightforward, you'll master it in no time at all. And it's as simple as, get over yourself, Kenny. Can you do that? I'll count to three, and then we'll do it. Okay, one, two, three. Get over yourself, Kenny. Aye, because he's a superstar. I mean, all that modesty stuff we've been subjected to this morning, we just need to get that out of our systems. He went to York, he was stunning. And people were walking about, I was saying to his wife this morning, people were walking about afterwards, and it was like, I was at Kenny Piper's session. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, uh, he based the whole thing in an Edwin Morgan poem. And I was inspired by him. I just thought he was, I, I really thought he was so, so good. So I then immediately recited Edwin Morgan's Strawberries, one of the finest poems about love that there is. And I immediately recited that in my session. So thanks, Kenny, it was brilliant. And the rest of the day, people were walking about going, I'm the Celts romantic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was nobody else rocking up to that event, particularly all the right-wing new tradies that deserved a good shooting. None of them had any poetry, but Kenny and I were churning it out because of Northern Progressive Education. And isn't it brilliant to have the timing that we've got? Because this has been a fantastic year, hasn't it? It's been a sheer source of joy for all of us engaged with the teaching profession. It's almost the, um, it's almost the 10th anniversary of Curriculum for Excellence starting, and we celebrated it with a flirtation with complete meltdown, um, which I thought was nice, with young people crying, with teachers stressed out their box, with parents anxious. I mean, it was brilliant because... You know, we had set out to declutter the curriculum and we'd been so massively successful in decluttering the curriculum, we had to bring out a tackling bureaucracy report, <laughs> which I think is, you know, astonishing. And despite the success, I'm slightly concerned that we may have left the assessment landscape just a little cluttered. I don't know if anybody else feels like that at all, but, you know, we're assessing, we're verifying. It's been a complete nightmare for people this year. And I do think there are serious concerns about how we take a grip of getting where we want to be on the basis of where we've come. And this year in particular, this year coming, hello. Hello. I'll give you a badge later. I do everything. I speak a hand out badly. <laughs> Any dead shifted anything like that, I'm happy to do that as well, it's no problem. Don't but give him your coffee order. <laughs> I, 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 and if you, if you let me know if you want to drink in or take it away, that's fine. Too. And we're waiting for the perfect storm this year, aren't we? Because we've got the Wood Commission report. How many recommendations are in the Wood Commission report? There you go. You see, nobody knows because there are so many, it's impossible to count them. So suddenly with the Wood Commission we're going to enter into new partnerships, we're going to do all sorts of things in the back of wood, all things that we need to do. But it's coinciding with the Creative Learning Plan. And again, huge commitment in that plan, huge ambition in that plan, all of that happening. We've got the ongoing implementation of CFE. And again, we're very clear that we haven't achieved what we want to achieve with it. We've got new hires. We're going to get a big push from Scottish Government on raising attainment in the most traditional way possible. I think in the autumn, we're going to get Mike Russell and we're going to get others banging on about raising attainment. We're going to be back to discussions about data. And at that point, I think, wonderful quote this week on Twitter, where Schleicher, the OECD statistician, had said uh, something without data is simply a bunch of opinions. And Andy Hargreaves had tweeted back, 
data without judgment is just a bunch of numbers. <laughs> and there's something I think hugely important around this because really what's happened every time we've placed an emphasis purely on raising attainment is we've widened the equality gap. Where we've introduced strategies to raise attainment, pure and simply, what we've done is we've created further divides in terms of how our young people attain. But that's fine, because we're also going to get a huge emphasis on tackling inequality in the coming year. So we've got all of that going on at a stage when school budgets are being slashed. One of my colleagues, one of my friends works in a primary school, not a huge one, 22,500 out of budget for next year. These are the kind of realities that people are dealing with. And at the same time, we've created an expectation that actually workload will be reduced next year. Now, how we manage that perfect storm, I think, is hugely interesting. And one of the things that worries me is that there's a possibility of a pendulum swing. Because if you look at how a lot of the work, a lot of the writing's going, particularly in England, but I suspect it may eventually have an impact here, despite the fact we've got a much healthier attitude to educational change and reform. But there is definitely a reassertion of values that I thought we'd left well behind in the black papers of the 1970s. And set against all of that, set against these pendulum swings, all of that, I think what we need to recognise, quote I've been using constantly, and I love it because it's a quote from me, and the point <laughs> is that in times of complex change, the answers will come not from the soloists, but from the choir. And I think that's the reality that we're dealing with. We genuinely need to get to a stage where we start not looking towards the solace and start looking towards the choir. And that's what this is about. One of my tweets this morning coming in was from an Amy Mann song where she says, the band just started playing and something strange occurred. And for me, that's what you're doing here. This is a band that, thanks to Fergal and a number of other people, just started playing and something strange occurred. You've got a bigger membership. You've got bigger association than some of the groups that are automatically included by Scottish Government in making decisions about Scotland's educational future. And the membership that you've got isn't a passive one that's activated when there's something that happens against their interests. The membership that you've got is an active membership which moves forward, drives for change and improvement constantly and does it on the basis of common sense consistently rather than ideology. People have got beliefs, they've got values, they've got ideology, that's not what you're about. What you're about is collectively drawing on the choir and find out which are the best tunes that we can sing and play and take forward. And sitting alongside that, I think we need far greater recognition than we've ever had that change won't be driven. We've seen far too much of that. And clearly what's happened, and again the points we made a number of times in Scottish education, that we start off with great ambitions and finish up with a compromised reality. That's the pattern that we've tended to have. And the thing that has slowed down the development has been a basic conservatism and a whole set of issues around workload. And what we need to be doing is recognising that you are people of power. One of my campaigns, I probably said it the last time I spoke to you, I certainly say it often enough, is I cannot accept a situation where these curriculum learning and assessment groups that have been set up to continue the development and implementation of curriculum for excellence are based on exactly the same membership as the management board which created it. I cannot see how that will bring the kind of dynamism change and energy that we actually need to translate what's become effectively a change in curriculum and assessment arrangements and turn it into something that's transformational. And that transformation will come by engaging with people like yourselves, the Teach Meet communities, the online communities, the podcasters, all of these people who are actually making a difference. Because what that creates is organic change. And that's what this group is fundamentally about, is a commitment to organic change. Not something that's brought into the system, something that emerges from people within it. And what you're doing, fundamentally, what you're doing today and what you're doing beyond today, is you're creating a move towards progress and improvement which is founded in engagement and trust, rather than threat and exposure. And that drive 
to push people forward on the basis of threat and exposure that somebody might find you doing something wrong, that you might not be adequately implementing something that you've been asked to deliver. That culture is ultimately damaging because all we do in that culture is pretend to make the change. And we're seeing it happening, I think, more and more that we get, and, and there's a wonderful Emperor's New Clothes thing going on, isn't there? Where consistently we're being told that everything's fine. And one of the things that really hacks me off, and you'll notice I am wearing the leather jacket, so I am speaking directly and frankly to you in that, you know, really consistent Bader Meinhof tone that I've begun to develop, especially <laughs> from these events. I think it's important that we get that absolutely clear. But we've had that Emperor's New Clothes thing going on, and every time anybody challenges it, the response I get back is that there's so much good practice in Scottish schools. Yes, there is. There's also so much good practice in English schools, in a much harsher and more negative political climate. There's good practice in Welsh schools, despite the fact that they lag behind in OECD indicators. There's good practice in schools that I've worked with in Northern Ireland. The good practice, I think, increasingly has come from people of good heart and good intent, people of generosity, People who've been prepared to make a contribution beyond their classroom. People who've been prepared to engage with others and recognise what will actually make a change. That's where the drive has come from. And I'm actually not convinced that Curriculum for Excellence has made an impact on that. Mark Priestley, whose work I think around Curriculum for Excellence has been wonderful, but one of the things that Mark did really strikingly for me was we were having a conversation about the impact of Curriculum for Excellence on students. And he was talking about it from a higher education point of view. And at one point I said to him, Mark, you're having this conversation as if you already had cohorts coming through who'd had the benefits of Curriculum for Excellence. And Mark's response was, well, actually, it's hard to tell the difference. We're now getting cohorts coming through who've been involved in cooperative learning in schools where teachers have an interest in pedagogy, where they've got an understanding of learning, where there's a clear commitment to try and do things better and in a more informed and a more research-driven way. That's what Curriculum for Excellence was supposed to permit. It was there to make sure we didn't just have schools of ambition, we had a system of ambition. And frankly, for me, the best hope of it becoming that comes from people like yourselves and days like today. And if we can forge the alliances with those in power, if we can get that involvement in the CLA, the future for Scotland, I think, is bright. But you're the ones that make it shine. Go, enjoy your workshops. Keep thinking about what we can do to seal the difference. Not to make the difference, but to seal the difference. And then having it sealed, build on it and take it further. Okay, thanks for your attention. Enjoy your work. Here.